Peter chapter 4. Uh, this week we're returning uh, to the book of 1 Peter, and we're also returning to the unifying theme of the book of 1 Peter, which is suffering for the sake of righteousness. Uh, so if you're looking for the, the thread that ties the entire book of 1 Peter together, that's it, suffering for the sake of righteousness. And in this particular section, in uh, 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 12 to 19, and we'll be focusing on verses 17 and 19, uh, Peter's giving these believers in Asia Minor some very necessary and practical advice about Christian suffering, uh, which is also a very timely word for us as well in the cultural climate that we find ourselves in. And it's apparent from the text that the suffering that these believers were experiencing across Asia Minor came as a complete shock to many of them. And it's, it's one of the reasons that uh, we believe that 1 Peter was written sometime before the great persecution that happened in AD 64 in Rome. Uh, if you remember from some of the background studies uh, that we did in 1 Peter, in AD 64, while Nero was the emperor in Rome, there was a fire that broke out in the city. The emperor himself was suspected of setting the fires himself because of his insatiable lust for building. He wanted to have the glory of designing a new Rome, uh, but the wooden apartments uh, around Rome were in his way. So he ordered that they be set on fire. It was reported that when the fires began, his soldiers watched, and uh, when the fires were put out in one place, they began again in another place, and while Rome burned, Nero fiddled and amused himself. And when the people of Rome suspected that Nero was responsible for these fires, instead of accepting the blame, he laid the blame on the Christians, the scapegoats. They were an easy target. And why was that? Why were Christians an easy target? Because they were already a strange bunch to begin with. You know, these, these Christians, we don't understand them. They don't fit any place into our society. And there were many misunderstandings about Christians, slanderous reports that were told about Christians. Christians were falsely accused of being cannibalistic because they referred to the elements of the communion, the, the body uh, and blood of, of Christ. The, the elements of communion were referred to as the body and blood of Christ. They were accused of being incestuous uh, because they called one another brothers and sisters, even their own spouses. They were considered haters of humanity because they didn't join in the practices of Rome, worshiping the, the gods of Rome, participating in the culture of Rome. So Nero turned the accusation against the believers. And Nero was never completely able to remove all the suspicion that he was responsible. But the Christians were enough of a distraction to keep the pressure off of Nero. And uh, Nero was only too happy to go along with the lie that he created. Now, one historian writes, he therefore turned the accusation against the Christians, and the most cruel tortures were accordingly afflicted upon the innocent. Even new kinds of deaths were invented so that being covered in the skins of wild beasts, they perished by being devoured by wild dogs, while many were crucified or slain by the fire, and not a few, few were set apart for this purpose, that when the day came to a close, they should be consumed to serve for light during the night. Their, their bodies were literally set on fire, and Nero himself put them in his garden as a spectacle. So, you know, to, to light his garden at night, he'd, he'd burn the Christians, hang up the Christians, set them on fire, and walk through the, the garden while the Christians burned. Now, if you're living somewhere in Asia Minor, and you hear the reports that believers in Rome are being used as human torches to light Nero's garden, would it come as a shock to you that the world hates Christians? <laughs> Uh, again, that's why I say we believe that, that this came after, that this great persecution came after the writing of First Peter. I think a, a human torch would be enough to send the message that the world doesn't uh, particularly care for believers. You know, you'd probably be bracing yourself for the persecution, you know, preparing your family for the end. The end is upon us. It's not going to come as a surprise if persecution comes knocking on your door. You might be startled by it, but you're not going to be surprised because you would expect it. But Peter is writing to people who are genuinely shocked, surprised, suffering for, for me? Well, what, what did I do? The, these believers would have only experienced the very first flames of this great persecution that was to come. They began to feel the, the first flickers of the heat, and they're, they're shocked. Like, what, what is this? I don't, I don't understand this. Surprised because it seemed to come out of nowhere. Nowhere. 
They were expecting an entirely different reaction and reception to Christianity. You know, maybe they imagined that, you know, if the world sees that we're not a threat, that we're responsible citizens, that we're hard workers, faithful marriage partners, that we're seeking to do good, maybe the world will be sympathetic to our cause. But that's not the world that we live in, not then and not now. This world is not our home, and we shouldn't be surprised when the world turns up the heat on the believer. And if we're going to stand firm, as Peter's been encouraging these believers to do, we can't be caught off guard. But I'm convinced that we have a church full of believers today who are just like the believers in Peter's day, who put down their guard and are clueless about what's going on all around them. There are too many of us who don't expect persecution in this world. We, we found a comfortable place in our society. We just assume that our neighbors will respect us, that our employers will be reasonable with us, that our government is only trying to protect us. It's like we've forgotten that we live in the same world that crucified our Savior, that killed the apostles, and that still sits in the lap of the evil one. We are in enemy territory. And it's always been that way. It's been that way since the fall. We've been in enemy territory. And Peter's warning is just as true for us today as it was then. Don't be surprised. <laughs> Wake up, pay attention, stand firm. And if you're going to stand firm, you've got to be prepared. You cannot be ignorant of Satan's devices. This is your wake-up call, okay? And that's what this section is, Peter's wake-up call. There's no need to be shocked. Why? Why, why don't we need to be shocked? Number one, you're to expect suffering. Look at verse 12. It says, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal which comes upon you for your testing. That word surprised is uh, from the Greek word zenidzo. If you've ever heard the, the word xenophobia, it comes from the same root of this world. It's, you know, the, the fear of, of foreigners, uh, xenophobia. Uh, but Peter is here saying, when trials come, when persecution comes, don't think of it like a foreigner. It's not some kind of stranger. You know, you should be expecting this. You know, th this is a, a local, you know, persecution comes. It's a, a local coming to, to greet you. It's not a foreigner. You should be expecting the knock on your door. Number two, you should exult in your suffering. Look at verse 13. But to the degree that you share the sufferings of Christ, keep on rejoicing so that also at the revelation of his glory, you may rejoice with exultation. There, there is a, a joy in suffering. That word exultation uh, speaks about greatly rejoicing. And at the revelation of his glory, that the day when Jesus Christ comes back, Jesus will be revealed for who he truly is, and you will be revealed for who you truly are. And every affliction that we suffer in this life will one day be rewarded. I love it in uh, uh, Luke chapter 6, in verse 23, it says, Be glad in that day, leap for joy when you suffer persecution. Why? For behold, your reward is great in heaven. For in the same way their fathers used to treat the prophets. The, the, the suffering, the persecution that we receive in this life is not worthy to be compared with the glory that will be revealed in us. So when we receive persecution on this side, we can chalk it up as glory on the other side. I, I know that that's going to count for glory. I can rejoice in that if I'm standing for Christ. Number three, you're to embrace your suffering. Embrace your suffering. Look at verse 14. It says, if you are reviled for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. If you are reviled, that's a conditional sentence, and it assumes that the condition is being met. If you are reviled, and I assume that you are, I mean, you're a believer, right? I mean, that's what we receive as believers. We receive reviling, people ridiculing us, rejecting us, slandering us, public shame. That's what we receive as believers. But, but if that's you, if you're being reviled for the name of Christ, what are you to consider yourself? Blessed. <laughs> I'm blessed. I'm to embrace that as a blessing. And the blessing of God's presence is promised to those who suffer for doing what is right. If we're going to, to stand firm, as Peter's been encouraging these believers to do, again, we can't be caught off guard. And we have to understand that this is a blessing of God. If I suffer for doing what is right, there's a, there's a, a resting of the Spirit of God on those who, who embrace suffering for Jesus Christ, that the Spirit of God rest on them. We saw that the, the Spirit of God rested on, on Stephen when he was being persecuted. The Spirit of God rested on him. 
And that's the blessing that we can look forward to. I mean, oftentimes uh, people want to talk about, you know, I want to experience the, the Spirit. Don't, don't you want to experience the move of the Spirit? Don't you want to just have a closer relationship with the Spirit of God? You know, Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me. I want the Spirit of the living God. Anointing, fall on me. Yeah, we want the anointing. I want the power of the Holy Ghost to fall on me. You really want the power of the Holy Ghost to, to rest upon you? Is that you? Do you want a spiritual experience? Be willing to stand in the fire of persecution. And then you'll experience the, the powerful move of the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God and of glory will rest on you if you're willing to stand up for Jesus Christ. Embrace the suffering, the spirit of glory and of God will rest on you. So we're to expect suffering, exult in our suffering. We're to embrace suffering as a blessing of God. And we're also to examine our suffering. Examine it. Look at verse 15 and 16. Make sure that none of you suffers as a murderer or thief or an evildoer or a troublesome meddler. Examine it. There's a certain kind of suffering that you should be ashamed about. If I'm suffering because I'm a, a murderer, uh, I shouldn't be expecting uh, the glory of God to rest upon me. Now, I should be ashamed of what I've done. Let none of you suffer like this. Don't claim that you're suffering for Christ's sake if you're suffering for your own shame. You should be ashamed of that. But Peter's saying that if you are reviled, persecuted for the name of Jesus Christ, that, that's when I glory in that. I'll take, the, I'll take the scorn. I'll take the shame. You, you want to say I'm, I'm one of those uh, backwards followers of Jesus Christ? Yeah, that's me. I, I'm the Bible-thumping wigging nut. That's, that's me. I'm one of those Jesus freaks. Yeah, I'll take that too. You want to put me down because of my association with Jesus Christ? I'll take it. I'll gladly take that. Embrace that. Glorify God in that name. I will glorify God because of my association with Jesus Christ. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, in verse 3, Paul tried to encourage Timothy, and he said, suffer hardship with me as a good soldier. Come, come on in, Timothy, the water's fine. Come on in. Jump in with me. Suffer hardship with me, Timothy. It's okay. 2 Timothy 3, verse 12, says, indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ, Jesus will be persecuted. If you're wanting to live for Christ, you're going to experience some level of persecution for your faith. So we're to expect it to exult in it, to embrace it, to examine it. All of that's reviewed from the last time we were together. But there's one more way that we should respond to Christian suffering, and it's found in verses 17 and 19. We should entrust ourselves to God in it, entrust ourselves to a faithful creator in suffering. And uh, we'll find that in verses 17 and 19, but I'll start at verse 12 just to get the context for us. First Peter chapter 4, starting at verse 12. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you which comes upon you for your testing, as though some strange thing were happening to you. But to the degree that you share the sufferings of Christ, keep on rejoicing, so that also at the revelation of his glory, you may rejoice with exultation. If you are reviled for the name of Christ, you are blessed, because the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. Make sure that none of you suffers as a murderer or thief or evildoer or a troublesome meddler. But if anyone suffers as a Christian, he is not to be ashamed, but is to glorify God in this name. For it is time for judgment to begin with the household of God. And if it begins with us first, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if it is with difficulty that the righteous is saved, what will become of the godless man and the sinner? Therefore, those also who suffer according to the will of God shall entrust their souls to a faithful creator in doing what is right. Why don't you bow your heads with me for a word of prayer? Heavenly Father, we uh, come before you, Lord, and uh, Father, we are grateful for each and every opportunity that we have to come before your word. Uh, Father, to, to hear from you, uh, understanding that uh, this word is from heaven. This is the infallible word, the inspired word of God. And uh, Father, I pray that you would speak to us, that you would open up these things uh, to us, that we may behold wonderful things in your word. And I, Father, that you would use me as a weak instrument to be a blessing to your people, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen.
Peter intends for his words to be a, an encouragement for suffering believers. But it may not be easy for us to understand how Peter intends this to be an encouragement for us. You know, if, if you or someone that you knew was, was suffering for the sake of righteousness and uh, somebody intended to bring some comfort to that situation and uh, told you, hey, take courage. This is the judgment of God. And it's time for judgment to begin with the household of God. I'm, I'm not sure if, if you'd be that, that encouraged by that. You know, here comes the judge. Here comes the judge. You know, is that, that an encouragement that uh, the judgment is coming? I'm not sure if uh, it's ever brought me any encouragement to hear that what I'm going through is the, the judgment of God. But what Peter means here when he uses that word judgment, it might be something different than what we're immediately thinking about. When we hear the, the word judgment, we immediately think of it in terms of the penalty for our sins or the, the just retribution for wickedness. But what would be wrong with that way of thinking about judgment in this context is that number one, first of all, Peter is clearly writing to believers who are suffering for the sake of what? Righteousness. They're, they're suffering for doing what's right. They're not suffering for doing what's wrong. Those who are suffering in this passage are said to be sharing the sufferings of Christ in verse 13. Reviled for the name of Christ in verse 14. They're suffering as Christians in verse 16. They're said to be righteous in verse 18. And they're committing themselves to doing what is right. Suffering for the penalty of their own sins doesn't even make sense in this context. That's not what we're talking about. So what's Peter talking about here? We need to keep in mind that, that words have a, a range of, of meaning. And the word for judgment that's used here does not always refer to suffering for the penalty of our sins. The, the Greek word for, for judgment, uh, krima, literally means a decision. And that's what the, the word judgment means here, a decision. And sometimes that decision is for a punishment of sins. For example, over in uh, 2 Peter uh, chapter 2, uh, Peter talks about false prophets, false teachers who introduce destructive heresies. And in 2 Peter 2 and verse 3, it says, their judgment from long ago is not idle and their destruction is not asleep. That's a destruction. That's the, a decision for punishment, decision for destruction, penalty of their, their sins. But that's not how this word is always used. And for an example, uh, why don't you flip over to, to John chapter 9, John chapter 9 and verse 39, where Jesus used this same word to speak both about people who receive the truth and people who rejected the truth. But he uses the same word judgment for both categories of, of people. John chapter 9 and verse 39. Look what Jesus says here. And Jesus said, for judgment, I came into this world. What does this judgment look like? What does the judgment look like? I've, I've come for judgment. What does that judgment look like? So that those who do not see may see, and that those who see may become blind. Th those who do not see may see, it's talking about uh, the unbelievers who are coming to understand who Jesus Christ is. And those who see, those who think they see, like the religious leaders of that day, that they would become blind. I've come for judgment. For some, they're going to see. For others, they're going to become blind. I'm coming to make a decision between these two, a decision between these two groups. And what Jesus is saying is that he's the dividing line uh, between all of humanity. He is the deciding factor. That, that word krima is used for both, literally to make a decision. And the question is, what kind of decision is being made about the believers back in 1 Peter chapter 4. You can flip back there uh, just so we can uh, explore this just a little bit further. What kind of decision is being made about these believers? And uh, for that, the answer to that question, all you'd have to do is look into the, into the context. What's the context talking about? Look back in chapter 4 and verse 12. Peter says here, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you which comes upon you for your testing. Something is being decided here in the test. That the testing is coming upon you. So don't think about this test as though some strange thing were happening to you. There is a purpose behind the fiery ordeal of suffering, and it's for your testing. There, there's a decision that's being made. It's, it's one of God's means of separating the true from the false. And this 
Testing is often used as the dividing line between two groups of people. That word testing, uh, the Greek word parasmos, is used for a trial, a test, even an experiment. And this is not the first time that we've seen this word. Look back in uh, chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1, look at verse 6. Peter here says that in this you greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you've been distressed by various trials. Here we go again, this parasmos, this, this testing. So that the proof of your faith, what's the decision being made? Are you a real believer or not? <laughs> the proof of your faith being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So what's Peter saying? He's saying that the suffering that Christians experience or that people experience for the sake of righteousness is like the fire that proves whether or not your faith is genuine or not. It's, it's a separating line. It's a separating judgment. It's just like the, the crucible being heated up to determine what kind of metal is inside this container. Is this real gold in here or not? The, the testing makes that separation. The crucible uh, makes that clear what kind of metal we're dealing with and what's left behind if it's genuine was pure gold. It passed the test. And Christian persecution, suffering for the sake of righteousness, is the crucible that the Lord will use to separate the genuine from the imposters. And the gold rises to the surface, and the imposters sink like lead. That's, that's what happens in suffering. Over in uh, Matthew chapter 13, Jesus used a, a parable that we covered uh, when we were in Matthew. How many, how many years ago was that? Uh, it had this parable in Matthew chapter 13. If you remember that parable, uh, Jesus gave the parable about the different kinds of, of soils. Remember that? You know, the seed was the same. The soils were, were different. The seed was the word of God. The soil was the, the human heart. And do you remember what Jesus said about the rocky soil? The rocky hearted believer, or actually the unbeliever? <laughs> Matthew chapter 13, verse 20 says, The one on whom seed was sown on the rocky places, this is the man who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. That's, that's what I'm talking about. Preach, preacher. That's, that's what the Bible say. That's it. That's what I'm talking about. That is what the word say. <laughs> I want that word. Yet, verse 21, he has no firm root in himself, but is only temporary. And when affliction or persecution arises because of the word, you know, we're happy when we're in the church and everybody's saying amen. Oh, yeah, that, that's, that's right. Bring it. Bring it on. Bring that word. But when you're going outside and you're receiving persecution instead of applause for the word, it says, then you show yourself to be temporary and immediately fall away. How does God test the condition of the heart? How is faith tested? Faith is tested through persecution. When persecution arises on account of that word, when persecution arises for the sake of Jesus Christ, the separation is made. The division is made. The determination is made. And when the true believer faces persecution for the sake of Jesus, he does not fall away as a result. John Bunyan's uh, Pilgrim, Pilgrim's Progress uh, had a character named Pliable who started the journey with Christian. But as soon as affliction started to arise, things got difficult. He struggled to get back out on his side of the bog. It's like, I'm not going in there. If that's, if that's what this road is all about, I'm not, I'm not following you to the, I mean, go and find that celestial city by yourself. I'm, I'm going to stay over here where things are easy. Pliable didn't have the heart to continue. He did not endure. He shrunk back. And the true believer does not shrink back. Flip over to the book of, of Hebrews real quick. Hebrews chapter 10. The primary recipients of uh, the book of, of Hebrews was uh, Jewish people who came out of Judaism in order to follow after Jesus Christ. But soon, they discovered that following Jesus didn't guarantee them their best life now. And all throughout the book of Hebrews, there's these stern warnings. Don't drift away. Don't go astray. Don't fall away. Don't fall through. Don't shrink back. Don't come short. But hold fast, enter in, press on, draw near, endure. That's the, the call in the book of, of Hebrews. And in Hebrews chapter 10, we learn about the furnace of affliction that came upon the, the believers here. Hebrews chapter 10, look at verse 32. 
The author says, but remember the former days when after being enlightened, you endured a great conflict of sufferings, partly by being made a public spectacle. There's the, 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 the ridicule, the reviling through reproaches and tribulations and partly by becoming sharers with those who were so treated for you showed sympathy to the prisoners, accepted joyfully the seizure of your property, knowing that you have for yourselves a better possession and a lasting one. The Hebrew believers were suffering, again, for doing what was right. And by going through the suffering, they proved themselves, those who endured, those who persevered, they proved themselves by that to be identified as true believers. Over in uh, Hebrews chapter 12, it's called the discipline of the Lord. When, when, we, when we go through this, this period of, of testing, it's called the discipline of the Lord. Hebrews chapter 12, look at verse 7. He says, it is for discipline that you endure. God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? It was actually a, an identifier of your relationship. The author of Hebrews was teaching them that, if, that God sets you apart as his children by putting you through the furnace of affliction. That's how, how God disciplines us. That's how he grows us. That's how he sanctifies us. And those who endured prove themselves to be genuine sons. God will even use affliction to produce further sanctification in our lives. And again, here, it's not necessarily because they were doing anything wrong. It's because God is growing them. God is, God is producing maturity, sanctification in their lives. And First Peter teaches us that God will test you in the furnace of affliction to prove the genuineness of of your faith. Just like in the book of Hebrews, that God will use that affliction to, to, to grow us and mature us in sanctification in Christ's likeness. So what's the message of 1 Peter? Don't, don't be surprised when it happens. It's the separating judgment of God. It, it determines who's genuine and who's not. It divides the true from the false. The crucible is where the decisions are made, and those who are genuine will stand the test of the fire. And there's three aspects of this uh, furnace of affliction, this judgment that Peter wants to, us to consider, the present judgment of God, the future judgment of God, and the consistent judgment of God. Let's take a look at, uh, back in 1 Peter chapter 4, look at verse 17 with me. 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 17. Peter says here, for it is time for judgment to begin with the household of God. Peter says that the time for that judgment is now. There's a present judgment of God that's already begun, which is really an incredible concept to, to think about. We often think about the, the judgment of God as this future reality, something that will come. But Peter says, I'm telling you, it's already here. The judgment has already begun. The, the time uh, that he says that he speaks about here, the time for judgment, uh, uses the, the Greek word kairos. It's the, uh, the right season. It's the opportune time. It's the crucial moment for that judgment to begin. It's not talking about the, the you know, certain date on the calendar like clock time. He says that, that the stage is set for this kind of judgment to begin. The persecution of the church is an indication that it's judgment season. It's judgment season. It, it's the time. It is the right time. Back in uh, 1 Peter 4 and verse 7, uh, Peter says that the end of all things is near, that the, the stage is set for judgment to begin. Yeah, that when the, when the pressure starts to come in upon the church, God is saying, it's, it's time. Don't, don't, don't be surprised by this. Wake up. Pay attention. This is your wake-up call. The time for judgment is here, and the place for judgment to begin is in the church. That's where it all begins. And once this judgment begins, there's no way to prevent the rest of it from following behind. But that's not surprising. The judgment would begin at the, the household of, of God, is it? Flip over to, to the book of uh, Revelation real quick. Book of Revelation. Revelation's uh, chapter 19. We have a, a description in the book of Revelation of eschatological judgment that's going to engulf the entire globe. In Revelation 19, we have a description of the one who will come to judge the nations. Look at uh, chapter 19, starting at verse 11. This is a day we should all be looking forward to. Revelation 19, verse 11. It says, And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on it is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and wages war. 
His eyes are a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems. And he has a name written on them, on him, which no one knows except himself. He is clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which are in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword, so that with it he may strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. And he treads the winepress of the fierce wrath of God the Almighty. This is a, a picture of global judgment. The entire world is going to be engulfed in this judgment of God. It's a fierce judgment. It's a thorough judgment. It's a complete judgment. But think about the book of Revelations. Where does this judgment start? Flip back to chapter 1. Chapter 1. Look at verse, look at verse 4. Revelation chapter 1, look at verse 4. John to the seven, what? Churches. It begins with the household of God. To the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come. Look at verse 11. It speaks about writing in a book what you see and send it to the seven churches. To Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamum, to Thyatira, to Sardis, and to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. Where does judgment begin? The first word in the book of Revelation is for the household of God. It's for the church. Then we get to the rest of the world. But it begins with the household of of God. And it's always been that way. God, God brought the children of Israel out of Egypt, but where did judgment begin? It was with the children of Israel. Exodus chapter 5, we have uh, Moses returned to the Lord and said, Oh Lord, why have you brought harm to this people? And who's he talking about? The children of Israel. Why have you brought harm to them? Why did you ever send me? Ever since I came to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he has done harm to this people, and you have not delivered your people at all. Over in chapter 8, uh, beginning with the fourth plague, God says, On that day I will set apart the land of Goshen, where my people are living, so that no swarms of insects will be there, in order that you may know that I, the Lord, am in the midst of the land. There was a separation that was made, but judgment started with Israel. It started with them. It begins with the household of God. Over in Ezekiel chapter 9, just to, to give you another indication of this, and I'll give you some time to find the book of Ezekiel in your Bibles. Book of Ezekiel, chapter 9. There are these uh, prophecies against the surrounding nations in the book of Ezekiel. There's prophecies against Ammon, Moab, Seir, Edom, Philistia, Tyre, Sidon, Egypt. All these nations that are going to be judged by God. But again, where does the judgment begin? Look at Ezekiel chapter 9. Ezekiel chapter 9. In this chapter, Ezekiel has a, a vision of six executioners. And the Lord spoke to one of these executioners in verse 4. Ezekiel chapter 9, look at verse 4. It says, The Lord said to him, Go through the midst of the city, even through the midst of Jerusalem, and put a mark on the foreheads of the men who sigh and groan over all the abominations which are being committed in its midst. So mark out those uh, who are faithful, who mourn over the sin of the land, similar to the, the blood being on the doorpost, there was a mark uh, that was uh, put on these men in this vision that Ezekiel had. Verse 5, it says, But to the others he said in my hearing, Go through the city after him and strike. Do not let your eye have pity and do not spare. Utterly slay old men, young men, maidens, little children, and women. But do not touch any man on whom is the mark. And you shall start where? From my sanctuary. From my sanctuary. So they started with the elders who were before the temple. Judgment begins with the household of God. And Peter takes this idea of judgment one step further. There's a, a judgment that God doesn't just bring for our, our discipline and, and sanctification. There's even a, a judgment of God that separates the believer from the unbeliever and proves the genuineness of faith. And it all starts at the household of God. Don't be surprised when you see the things start shaking up in the church. Don't, don't be surprised by that. I've been saying this for, for some time, but, uh, but we're, we're about to tell who's in and who's out pretty soon. <laughs> the, the more that the, the world gets shaken up is the more that you're going to be able to see when it all falls down, when it starts to sift, you're going to see which churches are still standing. What, what are the churches that are willing to take a stand for the truth even when it's unpopular? It's unpopular. 
Who are those men who are willing to, to take a stand? There's a separation that's taking place. Separation is taking place. And we're going to find out soon who's in and who's out. And we're already starting to see that today, aren't we? There's a separation that's taking place and decisions are being made. Even the kind of, of stand that our church took last week with a number of other churches uh, for our, our view of marriage and sexuality, a biblical view of marriage and sexuality. We're, we're living in a, in a time where many churches aren't willing to, to stand on these things. When you see people who were, who you're, you were convinced before, like, no, this, this brother is faithful. He's standing on the word of God. And then you see them starting to walk away, them starting to, to retreat. You need to understand the judgment begins with the household of God. That's where you're going to see it. You're going to see it in the household of God first. Who, who's going to be the, the, the church that will stand up in that future day? And I pray uh, that the Lord will allow us to be a, a faithful church standing on the word of God. There's a present judgment, a present judgment, a present sifting, a separation that's taking place. And Peter refers to that. But not only is there a present judgment, there's also a future judgment. Back to 1 Peter chapter 4. Look at verse 17 again. 1 Peter chapter 4, starting in, in verse 17. It says, For it is time for judgment to begin with the household of God. And if it begins with us first, what will be the outcome of those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if it is with difficulty that the righteous is saved, what will become of the godless man and the sinner? The judgment of God finds its starting point in the church, but that's not where its final destination is. There's a progressive development of judgment. It's from the church out. In 1 Peter 4, 17, when it says it's time for judgment to begin with the household of God, uh, the preposition with could also be translated as from. For it's time for the judgment of God to begin from. It goes out from the church and it starts to spread. It's the household of God out. And even though it starts with uh, the church in the present time, it ends with those who do not obey the gospel of God in the end time. And that's what Peter's pointing out here. There's a future judgment for those outside the household of God. And the implication is that for the believer, the testing, the fiery ordeal, the persecution, it ends in the present time. Like that's, that's where it starts and that's where it ends for the believer. That, that's all that we have to endure. There's no such thing as a, a suffering and purgatory. What we have to endure, we endure now. The trials of this life, and then they come to an end. I've, I've actually I've heard it said before that, uh, that this life is the closest that the believer will ever get to hell. This is the closest. The, the, the suffering that we experience in this life will be all the pain and affliction that we will experience. Because after this life is over, it's, it's all bliss and eternal glory. But the opposite is also true. That for the unbeliever, that this is as close to heaven as they'll ever get. Because after this time, when they experience the, the common grace of, of God, there's going to be nothing of that common grace and mercy that's extended beyond this life. So for the unbeliever, this is as close to heaven as they'll ever get. And this is an argument here Peter makes from the, the lesser to the greater. And what Peter is saying is if God will allow his own household to feel the flicker of the fire... If God will allow his own household to experience the cruel tortures which are about to come upon the believers, as we talked about earlier in AD 64, there were tortures that were going to come upon the believer. If God will allow his own children to suffer some of that, what do you think is going to happen for those who do not obey the gospel of God? If, if God will allow his children to be tortured, to feel the flame, to be thrown into the furnace, if God allows his children to experience that, what, what do you expect is going to happen for the unbeliever, for the ungodly? Augustine said, if the sons are chastised, what have the most malicious slaves to expect? When God comes to test the unbeliever, what will the end of that judgment look like? When he, when he puts them into the crucible, what's going to happen to them? When there's no gold to be found at all in their life, because there's no true faith. Psalm 2 and verse 5 says, Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. There, there's there's an, an end for the wicked. There's the, the outcome 
it speaks about here in verse 17. What will the outcome be? That word outcome, it's the Greek word telos, actually a form of that word, the, the, the verb form of that word is used over in a John chapter 19, when Jesus says that it is finished, it is complete. And the idea is like if, if it begins with the household of God, what do you think the judgment will look like when it's thorough and complete, when it's finished? There's an outcome for the unbeliever, and it's like Peter shudders to even think about it. Because he doesn't mention what it is. He just asks the question. He simply asks the question, what will be the outcome? What will become of? That's all he says. It's like Peter couldn't bring himself to describe the fate of the unbeliever. One, one author says, it's this, it says, if faith itself fear to follow the outcast into the outer darkness where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. Peter didn't even want to go there. I'm not even going to describe what the unbeliever will experience. But it's obviously a fate that's worse than death. Because think about it. Think, think about what the believers are about to experience, being fed to the wild beasts, being devoured by dogs, being crucified, being set on fire for a torch at night to amuse Nero and his company. That's what's going to happen to these believers. So it's obviously going to be worse than that. The outcome, the end for the unbeliever is terrifying beyond description. And actually by being reluctant, Peter being reluctant to describe the end makes it even more ominous. It's as if, uh, it's almost as if Peter couldn't bear to put it in writing. I don't even want to describe this. But Peter does give us a description of those who will be cast out into that outer darkness. Outside of the household of God, they're described as those who do not obey the gospel of God, which is a, another reminder that the call to repent and believe is a command. Command to be obeyed. Those who do not believe the gospel are not innocent. Unbelief is not a neutral position. Sometimes that's how we think about it. You know, like I'm just kind of like in the neutral ground in the middle. You know, I'm not believing, but I'm not unbelieving. I'm just like, I'm still trying to figure it out. We believe there's some kind of neutral line. Here it says it's a command. You're not neutral about a command. I mean, try that one with your kids. You know, I haven't decided, I haven't decided that I'm going to disobey you. But I haven't decided that I'm going to obey you either. You know, I'm still, I'm still kind of figuring it out. I'm just neutral in the middle right now, Dad. You know, don't, don't worry about it. I'll, I'll get to it someday. No, to do that is disobedience. You, you don't sit there at a command. I see a parent out there. You don't sit there at a command and say, well, I'm, I'm still trying to figure it out. I, I'm not disobeying you yet. I just haven't decided to obey. The, the command to believe is a command. And not to believe in itself is disobedience. When we look at faith in the Bible, it's presented in the terms of obedience. Acts chapter 6 and verse 7 uh, speaks about those who are becoming obedient to the faith. Romans chapter 1 and verse 5 uh, talks about Paul who received the apostleship to bring about the obedience of the faith. 2 Thessalonians 1 and verse 8, it speaks about dealing out retribution to those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. The call to believe is a command. Mark chapter 1, verse 15. Repent and believe the gospel. It's a command. John 12, 36. While you have the light, believe in the light. It's a command. Acts chapter 16, verse 31. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a command. You must believe. And even Peter describes salvation as obedience to the truth back in chapter 1 and verse 22. The unbeliever, it's not just an unbeliever. He's a disobedient unbeliever. That's what he is. He's disobedient. And he's described as godless and a sinner. Back to 1 Peter chapter 4 again. Look at verse 18. It says, And if it is with difficulty that the righteous is saved, what will become of the godless man and the sinner? Godless doesn't mean that he's just without God. It's to say that, that he has no respect for God. He doesn't fear God. He doesn't worship God. No, it's, it's a negated form of a, a positive word that we find elsewhere in Scripture of a worshiper. The, the, the word sebeomai was used to, to worship. This is the ne negation of that. I'm, I'm no longer a worshiper. I'm somebody who doesn't worship. I, I refuse to worship. I refuse to, to fear. I refuse to bring honor. 
Acts chapter 13 and 17, some of the the Gentiles were described as God-fearing Gentiles because they worshiped God. And again, this is the opposite of that. I don't fear God. I'm not a God-fearer. The word for godless is the, the word for the one who does not respect, does not fear, does not worship. He's ungodly. And he's also described as a sinner, an adjective used to describe the the habitual practice and lifestyle of the one who does not fear God, refuses to believe in God. That's that's his his state. And the point that Peter is making here is that if God will allow those who believe in him, those who respect him, those who worship him to face the fire of affliction, what do you expect him to do with those who say, I refuse to worship God? I refuse to, to fear him. I will not bring him honor. What in the world do you expect God to do with the godless man and the sinner? Peter quotes here from Proverbs chapter 11. I just want to flip you back here real quick. If you might notice in uh, 1 Peter 4 that that's set apart as a quotation of uh, Old Testament scripture. And Peter's actually quoting from the book of, of Proverbs. And Proverbs chapter 11 in particular is filled with these contrasts between the way of the wicked and the the way of the righteous. The way of the, the wicked and the, the way of the, the righteous. Look at uh, Proverbs chapter 11, and I'll start at verse 9. Proverbs chapter 11, starting at verse 9. Listen to what uh, the author says here. Look at verse 3. It says, The integrity of the upright will guide them, but the crookedness of the treacherous will destroy them. Riches do not profit in the day of wrath, but righteousness delivers from death. The righteousness of the blameless will smooth his way, but the wicked will fall by his own wickedness. The righteousness of the upright will deliver them, but the treacherous will be caught by their own greed. When a wicked man dies, his expectation will perish, and the hope of strong men perishes. The righteous is delivered from trouble, but the wicked takes his place. With his mouth, the godless man destroys his neighbor, but through knowledge, the righteous will be delivered. Over and over and over again, if you pay attention, it places the wicked in contrast with the righteous. And what's consistent, what's repeated, is this warning, don't think that you'll get away with unrighteousness. If, if you're crooked, if you're treacherous, if you're ungodly, you will perish. Over and over again. Wicked will fall. Expectation will perish. The wicked takes his place. But one of the objections that people raise to proverbs like this is but what about the exceptions right i mean there's exceptions i know know wicked people who prosper (laughs) flip on your tv sometime there are wicked people who are prospering there are people who don't seem like they're perishing They, they get away with their treachery and we have to admit that that's true as you look at life as the way that things play out there are times when the the wicked prosper We have to admit that that's true. But we also have to admit that we don't see the whole picture, right? We don't see the whole picture. I I love this saying that said, uh, the the wheels of justice turn slowly, but grind exceedingly fine. (laughs) You you might not always see the, the wheel grinding, but the wheel's still moving, the wheel's still grinding, And by the time it's done, there's nothing left. Everything's turned to powder. The wheels of justice turn slow, but they grind exceedingly fine. And what Peter picks up from in this proverb is that what happens on this earth is not all that there is. Look at verse 31, Proverbs chapter 11. Look at verse 31. It says, if the righteous will be rewarded in the earth, how much more the wicked and the sinner. That's what Peter is quoting from. And what Peter is talking about, back to 1 Peter chapter 4, is what happens after this earth. (laughs) What happens after this earth? There's a time period that we're allotted to be here, but there's also a time that comes afterwards. There's, There's the time now, but there's also the end. There's the outcome that we can't see. And the wheels of justice are still turning. Don't think that you're going to get away. Don't think that the wicked are going to get away. We don't always see the righteous saved on this side of eternity, do we? (laughs) People who are doing the right thing for the right reason. Like I said, not too long after this time, the, the Christian religion would be prohibited by law. 
It would be unlawful to become a Christian. Even Peter would be condemned to death and suffer crucifixion. But that's not the end. The righteous will be saved is what Peter says. Back in chapter 4, he says the righteous will be delivered. The righteous will be saved. And the wicked will take their place. We need to keep in mind that this life is not all that there is. Peter reminds us that the righteous is saved, even though it's with difficulty. With difficulty, the righteous is saved. We're not escaping difficulty, but the ungodly and the sinner will fall by his own wickedness. There's coming a time when justice will be met. And Peter, again, doesn't bear to describe what that judgment looks like. All he simply says is what will be the outcome? What will become of the godless man? There, there's coming a time of reckoning. And what will that reckoning look like? And then finally, Peter reminds us of the consistent faithfulness of God. He's the consistent, consistent judge. He's the faithful creator. And this is where Peter lands the plane. What, what else are we to keep in mind when we suffer persecution for the sake of righteousness? What, what are we to, to think about? We're to, we're to keep in mind that God is a faithful judge. God is a faithful judge. How should I respond to Christian suffering? How can I stand firm when the, the wicked seem to be prospering and the righteous are perishing? Where, where do I turn when I'm caught off guard by my own experience of suffering? It, it just didn't happen to somebody out there. It happened to me. I was doing the right thing, and I'm suffering for it. Some of us might have, like I said, expected a quiet life as a Christian. I'm, I'm just trying to do the right thing. I'm just trying to pay my bills and, you know, do my job and love my wife and raise my kids. I mean, why? Why, why can't I just be left alone? You know, maybe I can just stay under the radar at work, right? Maybe, maybe they won't ask me what I think. <laughs> just don't ask me what I think. Because I'm going to have to tell you. And you're not going to like what I have to say. <laughs> Just leave me alone. I want to stay under the radar. Sometimes that's how we want to be, right? You know, then you got people like Dave who, David who wants to jump in. Like, you know, please ask me what I think, right? <laughs> but some of us are just like, I just, I just want to be left alone. Don't, don't ask me what I think because you're not going to like it. Maybe at that next family gathering, they, they won't try to pull you into the conversation. To hear what your, your thoughts are. Maybe you're like Lot and uh, thinking that, that maybe I can be accepted in Sodom. Maybe I can gain their favor. Maybe they really do respect me. They like me. They really, really like me. They like me. But now you're suddenly realizing I can't stay hidden for too long. <laughs> Eventually it's got to come out. I've, I've been outed. Okay, now you, you know who I am. I'm Sorry. <laughs> and the fires of persecution are coming for me. What, what do I do? First Peter is written for those who are suffering according to the will of God. And Peter is pulling in the previous context into this passage. It says, therefore, verse 19, those who suffer according to the will of God shall entrust their souls to a faithful creator in doing what is right. Like I said, he's pulling in the previous context. If you're suffering according to the will of God, it means that you're also suffering for righteousness' sake, right? That, that's, that's the will of God, that you would suffer for the sake of, of righteousness. And according to verse 15, you're not to suffer as a, a murderer, or thief, an evildoer. That's not how I'm suffering. I'm, I'm suffering according to the will of God. I'm, I'm doing the will of God, and I'm suffering. And, and while I'm suffering, I need to recognize that this is the crucible that God is using to test me. And if that's you, you're suffering for righteousness, you can embrace that suffering as God's gracious and sovereign will for your life. You need to recognize that this is how God tests the genuineness of your faith. And if you've examined your suffering, verses 15 to 16, you can embrace your suffering, verse 14. You can exult in your suffering, verse 13. And you shouldn't be surprised at your suffering, verse 13. You, you can expect it, expect it to come. And then you're to entrust the Lord with it. Therefore, those who suffer according to the will of God shall entrust their souls to God. If I'm examining my suffering and all these other things are true about me, I'm embracing it, exulting in it, expecting it, then I can entrust God with it. 
I can entrust a faithful creator. And actually in the original language, the, the faithfulness of the creator comes out first. Instead of it saying that, um, uh, saying that you shall entrust your souls, entrust their souls to a faithful creator, it says to a faithful creator, entrust your souls. It places the, the faithfulness of the creator up front. And what is Peter reminding these believers of? H- have you ever considered what kind of God you're talking about? H- have you really considered the God that you're entrusting yourself to? I mean, we're, we're talking about the God who created the universe out of nothing. Psalm 33, verse 6 says, By the word of the Lord the heavens were made, and by the breath of his mouth all their hosts. And it continues to say, He gathers the waters of the sea together as a heap. He lays up the deeps in storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. For he spoke and it was done. He commanded and it stood fast. In Psalm 102, verse 25, it says, Of old you founded the earth and the heavens are the work of your hands. All things came into being through him, John 1, 3. By faith we understand that the worlds were prepared by the word of God. The entire created universe came into being by the breath of his mouth. He he just spoke. And by the sheer power and authority of his voice, that that creation just just popped out of nothing. That is incredible to think about. I mean, the way I like to think about it is just because of of the authority of his command. It's like something has to be created just to respond because he's so authoritative. Let there be. And it's like, yes, I'm here. (laughs) Out of nothing. Peter goes beyond just the creation of this Visible and invisible realities it talks about this faithful creator, but, but again, recognize he's a faithful creator. Because not only did he create, he also does what? He sustains his creation. The, the initial power that was required to create all of reality is beyond comprehension alone. Just that, that he can create everything from nothing just by speaking it. I mean, you want to talk about power. I mean, that's it, right? That I can just speak it and it happens. But now beyond that, God keeps all the plates spinning. He keeps it moving. He he sustains everything. Isaiah 42 verse 5 says, Thus says God the Lord who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spread out the earth and its offspring, who gives breath to the people in it and spirit to those who walk in it. He, he, He not only creates, but then he gives life and breath and spirit. He sustains it. All those who walk upon the earth, you know, the, the 7 billion plus people on this planet, God is sustaining, giving spirit to, giving life to. Acts 17, 25, he himself gives to all people life and breath in all things. Psalm 145, verse 15, the eyes of all look to you and you give them their food in due time. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3, speaking about Christ, says he is the radiance of his glory, the exact representation of his nature and upholds all things by the word of his power. We, we are literally being held up by the breath of God, like God is holding us up by the breath of his power. Just the word of his power is holding us up. You, you, you survive right now by the word of God. Like that's how you survive. And it's the faithfulness of God that holds everything together. Like, like the atoms that are being held together. How, how does that hold together? The things that should be blowing apart right now. It, it, it's God. His his word is sustaining everything. The earth remains fixed. The order of the sun and moon persists because of the faithfulness of your God. Jeremiah 33, 25 speaks about God's covenant for the day and night and the fixed patterns of the heaven and earth being established. We, We can predict the sunrise tomorrow because of the faithfulness of God. The seasons are what they are because of the faithfulness of God. Genesis 8, while the earth remains, seed time and harvest and cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night shall not cease. We can count on there being an end to winter because of the faithfulness of God. Psalm 74, 17, you have established all the boundaries of the earth. You have made summer and winter. Now consider this. <laughs> this God who created everything sustains everything. By the word of his power, just because he says it. This is the one who's saying, entrust me with your soul. You get that? Can, can you trust a God like that? Can you trust a God like that? If he's been faithful to do all of this, 
don't you consider him faithful to take care of your soul? <laughs> he can uphold the, the universe, the infinite galaxies. From our perspective, it's like there's no end. He's upholding all that just by his word, and you don't think he can, can take care of you? There's no one who's more faithful. There's no one who's more powerful. There's no one who's more wise. And even if I suffer, I understand that my suffering is under his sovereign care. And I don't need to be disturbed and shaken by it. I don't have to be thrown off my course and lose my composure because of it. Who else would I rather entrust my soul to during a time of affliction? That, that word for entrust is actually a, a term that was used in banking. It was used for uh, uh, entrusting your money or other valuables to somebody for safekeeping. And what Peter says is entrust your soul, the most valuable possession that you own, entrust that to God. Place that into the hands of God. Put it in his deposit box. He can keep you. I entrust my soul to a faithful creator. And how do I do that? By doing what's right. That's how I do it. I just keep doing what I've always been doing. I'm suffering according to the will of God. I've examined myself. I know it's not because of something that I've done. I'm, I'm trying to do what's right. I'm trying to honor God and I'm suffering for it. And I'm just going to keep on doing it. Persecution may come. And it will come if you're seeking to be godly in Christ Jesus, right? But you know what? I have entrusted my soul to a faithful creator. I might have gotten in trouble for doing what's right. But you know what? I'm going to keep doing what's right. <laughs> because that's what God has asked me to do. And he's the faithful one. I want to be faithful to him. And I understand that I've placed my eternal soul into his hands, and he is capable of safeguarding my soul. I love uh, John 10, 28, where Jesus says, I give eternal life to them, and they will never perish. And no one will snatch them out of my hand. You've entrusted your, your soul to God. Nobody's taken you from him. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. It's like the double grip of God. You're in my hand, and you're in the Father's hand. There's nobody that's going to snatch you out. You're safe with me. Your soul is safe with me, even if you suffer. For doing the right thing, you can trust me. And for the believers who are here, we need to trust that God is doing his work even in the furnace of affliction, right? I love the, the hymn, How Firm a Foundation. When through fiery trials thy pathway shall lie, my grace all sufficient shall be thy supply. The flame shall not hurt thee. I only design thy dross to consume and thy gold to refine. The, the flame is not going to remove the gold from your life, what's valuable in your life. It's not going to take that away. There's other things that will be falling off. The dross is going to come off. That which is contaminated is going to fall off. But, but I haven't designed it to hurt you. <laughs> I haven't designed it to hurt you. I haven't designed this flame to hurt my children. Charles Spurgeon commenting on this passage says, the olives must go into the press if oil is to be squeezed. The grapes must be trodden with loving feet before the wine flows. The fowl must be used to bring out the true quality of our metal we will never be made into fine gold unless we are frequently put into the crucible of hot fire. Trials make faith grow stronger. Were it not for our trials, he goes on to say, we would turn our back on the enemy. But because of our trials, we become as bold as lions for the Lord our God. We expect it. We exult in it. We embrace it. We examine it. And we entrust our sufferings to a faithful creator. Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we uh, come before you. And Father, we uh, do thank you that uh, for those of us who are here who are believers, that you haven't designed the fire to hurt us. You've designed the fire to, to prove us, to make a separation between the true and the false, to grow us in Christ's likeness, to make us look more like the Savior. You've designed these things for our good. And uh, Father, I pray that uh, we would submit ourselves to that kind of testing. Uh, Father, that we wouldn't turn away when the fire is starting to, to heat up in our lives. Father, whether it's in our families, uh, whether it's on our jobs, whether it's in our neighborhoods. Uh, Father, there's uh, going to be a time when we'll have to make a stand and we cannot retreat.
And Father, I pray that, that we, would, we would anticipate that, that we would expect that, that we wouldn't run from that, and that we would entrust you with that suffering as well. You are the faithful creator. You're the one who is faithful to us. You've been so faithful to us, God. And Father, I pray that uh, you'd help us to be faithful to you. In Jesus' name, I praise you and give you thanks. Amen. At this time, before uh, uh, we're dismissed... Um...